Let's just draw our attention to the screen for a moment. Today, after our message, after lunch, or whenever you go this afternoon, we're going to be launching Compassion 100. We're going to be talking about that during the service. What is that all about? Also, just to mention, again, just number two, our church retreat. The deadline is next week. If you desire to come to our church retreat, please uh, be part of that. Will we have service here? Yes, we will still have service here. We'll talk more about that eventually. And then our evangelistic meetings on the 28th of October. Please pray for that. We need your prayers. We need people to be part of that, getting involved and signing up for that to make sure you have the opportunity to, to be involved. We're going to be sharing some things at the end of the service here, giving you an opportunity to be part of this event. Also, our Korean church plant group, in a few weeks, will be doing an evangelistic series in Antioch. I can't read those words there, but you know what? At least I, can, I know it's going to be held in the community center in Antioch. So praise the Lord. They're bringing an evangelist from South Korea. Pray for that ministry. Remember, there, our goal is to grow the kingdom of God. Amen? Let me just share some information around the world. You have been, uh, been made aware of what's happening. Our nation right now is very tense with what's been happening around the nation. The riot that took place in Charlotte, the killing uh, that, uh, that they were saying, what happened? Why did this take place? It seems like it's a very delicate time in our, not only our nation, but in the world. You wonder who's going to die next. Just this morning when I turned on the news, there were five shots dead in the mall. Somebody went in the mall and decided to wreak havoc for those shopping in, in Washington State. This is just not, com this is not common now. Seems like people will go and shoot and kill. It doesn't matter. And we try to make sense out of all of this. We try to see what's going on. Why is, are there lawlessness in the world? Especially uh, when you see around the nation, you think about this. Why is this taking place? You know what? The devil knows. He has a short time. He creates evil and havoc, realizing that the more he can bring down, the less we'll be able to be ready when Jesus comes again. An opportunity for the people of God to be able to be here today, to be able to say, Lord, what can we do to prepare our son, our daughters, for the soon coming of Jesus? What can we do to prepare our husband and our wives for the soon coming of Jesus, right? This is why it's all about. It's an opportunity for us to, to praise God, to, to, to go to God and say, Lord, what else can we do? Pray with me, Father in heaven. Lord, at this moment, I seek an opportunity for you to speak through your weak servant. Lord, that I may preach your message with boldness and clarity. But yet, dear Father, I am praying that you will use these words, that your words be my words, that your thoughts be my thoughts. Lord, we have talked about this, we have prayed about this, and I give you permission to edit and redirect where this message should be going. You're in control, dear Father. And Lord, I'm praying for you to please bind the evil one. He's not welcome here. Thank you for hearing my prayers in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want you to hold up your Bibles, your iPhone or iPad, whatever version of Bible or Word of God you're using. Hold it up to, and say together with me, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You believe it? Amen. Amen. Our message today is entitled Creating Contagious Compassion. Creating Contagious Compassion. Before I go to the service, I, I fail to recognize here our, I, I, our conference, the conference president, the retired conference president of South Central Conference, Elder, Elder Brown. Will you please stand so people can see who you are? And I will appreciate his ministry here for the South Central Conference and appreciate his presence here today. Question today is this. Question is, how do we create contagious compassion? What is that all about? We've been talking about breaking through the barriers 
uh, we're, we're praying how to break the cycle in our lives, our personal lives. We're breaking through the barriers in the church, in our community. But now the question is, how do we create contagious compassion? I invite you to turn to the Word of God and look into the Word of God. Join me now as we read in Luke chapter 10. It's interesting that the story that Brian shared is found in also in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to do something different. And I noticed this. It's being done in, in, in some of our sister churches. When they read the word of God, they ask the congregation to stand. So I'm going to invite you to stand here as I read this passage in Luke chapter 10. Just this, this portion here. When I read out loud, in starting with verse um, 25. And behold... A certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side, Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him and went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set on him his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out to Denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Amen? You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you. The parable of the Good Samaritan is a powerful story on many levels. It teaches us the importance of caring not only of those in need, but also those of different from us. And so we're going to extract here some principles as a basis because of the parables that Jesus taught, this is probably one of the top parables that he had shared besides the prodigal son. And so let's extract what some lessons here. Look in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer said, tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I want you to know this lawyer that we understand to be. It's not the lawyer that we know of today. This individual is knowledgeable of the Torah. He is knowledgeable of all the laws and intricates of the, 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 the Ten Commandments and the ceremonial laws. He's an expert on this. And so he was here trying to test Jesus, trying to trick him into this question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Well, one thing that's quite interesting is that the Lord's question reveals the fact that, first of all, he's asking the wrong question, right? That basically his concept of righteousness was entirely wrong. Essentially, to him, he's saying, what must I do? Just like a scribe and, and the and religious leaders that taught the people today, there's certain things that you have to do, you have to do this, and you have to do this in order for you to be saved. And let me tell you from the, from the very beginning, my friends, you cannot earn salvation. Amen? Jesus did already for you on Calvary. And, and so even here, even here, the fact that, well, Jesus did not die yet here in this case, right? So how could the lawyer get the right example? Because you know what? They were taught that the sacrifice, and every time they brought into the lamb, into the sanctuary, in the temple, they were taught from very young that this is a symbol, the symbol of the Messiah to come, the Passover lamb, who will take away the sins of the world. Amen? And so 
then Jesus gave a powerful reply and he said, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? He was asking a law question, but Jesus gives a grace answer, right? What is your reading of it? And, and so he replies. He replies basically in verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God and your, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. In other words, he was repeating the Shema, basically that Jewish children from very young were taught to remember in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Everybody was taught about this one. But something that did not catch on, my friends, here. How, what does it mean to love God with all your heart, with all your strength, with all your mind? What is it really trying to convey? It's conveying basically this, my friends, that your God is number one, is priority in your life, is foremost, and he takes basically precedence of all the things that you do in your life, right? And so basically this is what you do. And then the next part, he's saying, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so the, the lawyer asked the next question, basically, that trying to throw Jesus off. But remember, I want you to know several things. Yes, you can't inherit eternal life. You have to love God, and you have to love people. How can you, how can you summarize this? You see, you, you, can't, you have to understand the lawyer still could not comprehend what does that really mean. And we're going to break this down in a few minutes here even more. I want you to see here. He comes up with a question, who is my neighbor? He knew that was a, 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 a question that they, the Jewish leaders, religious leaders disputed. They wanted to know who's my, who's my, my neighbor. What Jesus is begins to, to share here is that your neighbor is not, doesn't limit it to the color of the skin. It doesn't limit it to the religious affiliation. It doesn't limit it to political position that determine who you should help. It, your neighbor is not somebody who dresses like you, somebody who does not wear tattoos or, or wear certain things. The lawyer had to understand or still did not understand because he's trying to say, you know what, Lord, I'm, I'm pretty good. Master, I'm pretty good. I don't kick my dog. I don't steal. I don't cheat. I obey the law of the land. And so Jesus then begins to, uh, to give an example about what it means to love your neighbor. And uh, you know this classic story. We, he tells a story about a certain priest. I mean, a man that went down from Jerusalem, by the way, from Jerusalem to Jericho. By the way, there's a, it's a high elevation, basically about 1,200 feet, going down to almost 700 feet elevation at sea level where Jericho is. And when you go down through that winding path, and there was a lot of uh, rocks in between those paths, it was easy for, for, for crooks, criminals, to be able to hide behind those rocks and mug people and, and, and uh, steal and, and basically kill people just to be able to gain advantage. Now, what's, what's going here next is that it says here in verse 31, and a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So imagine for a moment, here's the, the uh, wounded victim and lying down there, and the priest, notice, passed by the other side. He passed by the other side. Now, I want you to understand that um, that priest may have been very busy. He's a priest, he's a pastor, he's a clergyman, and he must have been, he must have been a very important appointment. Remember, if he's on the way to the synagogue or the temple or the church, people are waiting for him to give the sermon, right? So he must be in a rush, in a very important um, errand. Now, so let's say, let's give him the benefit of the doubt that he had a very important appointment, Okay. Likewise, in verse 32, a Levite went, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. Notice the difference this time. He looked at the victim, and then he left and went to the other side. 
What's interesting here, Levites basically are from the tribe of, of Levi, the son of Judah, and the mother, mother's Leah, right? And so the, the Levites basically were the only tribe who did not bow down to the, uh, the idols of Baal or the golden calf that the Israelites built when Moses was up on the mountain, they were faithful, they were loyal, they were good people, they were righteous people. And so it was interesting when they saw the individual, they just, I mean, when he saw the individual, he just looked and went on to the other side. Now, something that's interesting here, because the Levite and the priest realize when you touch somebody, a body, you're going to be defiled. And then, then you have to go through the cleansing process of at least seven days. And that's going to delay you from getting to your errand or to your appointment, right? And so what happened here is quite interesting, is that the question that takes place is, uh, is quite an interesting contrast when two researchers named John Darley and Daniel Batson, they did a study called, called a study of situational and dispositional variables in helping uh, behavior. And in the 1970s in Princeton University, this, this psychologist basically conducted what they call the modern Good Samaritan. They took 200 seminarians, students that were going to the seminary, studying to be pastors or ministers, okay? And so they called this experiment from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, the classic study basically, they arranged between two buildings in the campus, and what's interesting, their hypothesis basically is this. Number one, people thinking religious helping thoughts would still be no more likely than others to offer assistance. That's hypothesis number one. Hypothesis number two, people in a hurry will be less likely to offer aid than others. Hypothesis number three, people who are religions in a Samaritan fashion will be more likely to help the, than those of a priest or Levite fashion. Okay? In other words, people who are religious, for what it will gain them, will be less likely than those who will value religion for its own value or searching for meaning in life. Do you see the difference? So this is the hypothesis they came up with. So what they told the students, they gave them several scenarios. Each student was directed to walk in the other building, and upon arriving there, they were to present a short talk on a given topic. Some of the students were told to speak on the subject of the Good Samaritan parable, okay? As each student walked in the other building, they encountered a shabbily dressed person slumped by the side of the road. Each student would pass the victim, and on cue, the victim would cough twice and groan. Now, the researchers wanted to know how these seminarians, this future pastor, were supposed to react. Darley and Basson published this uh, findings. It's quite interesting as I researched this. They found significantly the result basically is this, that those students who were on their way to deliver a talk on the Good Samaritan, you know what they found out? Were no more likely to stop than any fellow student. Now, in fact, the researchers found that the students hurrying to deliver their talk on the Good Samaritan literally stepped over the victim to get to their appointment. In other words, thinking about the Good Samaritan story made no difference in their actual behavior. Consider this. So here are the, the, the results. Being busy... When participants were busy, they were less likely to stop and help the man on the street. Lesson learned here, if you're in a rush, you're not going to stop by and try to help anyone because you're trying to get an appointment. You want to try to be there on time. Now, think about this. We're in a fast-paced life, aren't we? We're always running on the fast lane. No time to stop or slow down. And so there are people that are hurting all along the way, yet we're missing them because we're in a rush to get to our destination. Yet all along the way, here is, here is basically the mission that Jesus gave, basically, as an example for his people to, to be able to show compassion. Now, it's interesting, the one who are early, 
There were those who were early. They were given a, a lead time before the appointment. Were more likely to help those who were on time. And then notice those who are always late in their appointment didn't have time to help. And so the results basically, they came up. People in a hurry did not help compared to those who had more time. People thinking about caring thoughts did not help. And finally, those who did not stop did appear aroused, by the way. <gasps> Somebody's hurting. They were anxious, but they went on. Because now they had a conflict, whether to help the person or to be late for their appointment. Right? Now, what's interesting in this study, basically, as we notice the words in verse 31, by now, now by chance, a certain priest, what does it say? Came down. Jerusalem was on top. Jer Jericho was below. So if they had an appointment, it was an appointment to the church, to the temple, right? They would be going up, not going down. Are you with me? That means they had no appointments. Maybe they were hungry, by the way. They were going for dinner. We don't want to be late. For dinner, we don't want to be delayed. Maybe you had to mow the lawn. Are you with me? The priest was coming down the road, and he passed by on the other side. Now, we don't have enough clue about the Levite. He probably was going the same way, too. But they did not stop at all. What's interesting that I want you to know, uh, Martin Luther King gave, a, gave also an example in this powerful story and parable, and he basically said this, and he say, that said this, the, Le the Levites and the priests were saying, if I stop, what will happen to me? That's the question the Levite and the priest ask. But we should, he said, we need to reverse the question. The good Samaritan said, if I do not stop, what will happen to him? What will happen to him, right? And so this is so important that we realize what we need to remember this. If I do not stop to help the man, what will happen to him? Symbolically, Jesus Christ is the good Samaritan. Even when I've been beaten in the road of life, been robbed of our dignity, been robbed of our holiness, been robbed of our experience, Jesus stopped. If Jesus did not stop, what would happen to us? Hello? Are you with me? What would happen to us? Now, as we move on along here, there's a, Jew, a Hebrew word, Hebrew a saying basically, uh, pituach nefesh. Pituach, you know, the guttural ach nefesh. Basically means, number one, the obligation to help any life under threat. That's what it means. And number two, when two rules are in tension, the obligation to save human life overrules all other obligations. Every Jewish leader, especially religious leader, knew what pituach, pikuach nefesh means. In other words, somebody's hurting. Yes, you may get defiled, but yet... According to this rule, it should overrule that. So they were exempted. Are you with me here? So here is a deliberate neglect of somebody that has the opportunity to help individuals. I want you to know, friends, what we need today in church is people with compassion. People, we need that today in church that who are willing to stop and show compassion to those who are hurting. If I do not stop to help this person, what will happen to him? If I don't go to my neighbor and share the good news of eternal life, what will happen to him? If I don't stand up and speak in love and do good to others, what will happen to the doomed, the damned? What will happen to them? Right? The unlikely hero is the Samaritan. By the way, you have to understand several things here. Even the lawyer does not call him by his name. We, last Monday, we were in uh, Atlanta for the, the Southern Union constituency meeting. On the way back from Atlanta, I was rushing home so I can make it in time for dinner. 
And then the Lord said, the Holy Spirit began to talk to me, pull, it, pull aside to Winchester. Pull aside to Winchester. Go see Horace and Ruth Swain. And I called their phone number. No answer. I called again. I was saying, okay, they're not there. I, can, I did my part and ready to go. I called again. Three times after I called, she finally, uh, Ruth picked up. And she said, Pastor, we're not home. We're in the hospital. I said, what happened? Horace fell down last week and broke his ribs. And so here's a picture of Horace. And by the way, he says hello to, to each one of you here. And a picture of Ruth. They're frail, they're fragile, and they needed the, the prayer of their pastor, and they need your prayers. I share this basically as we go on to the story. In verse 33, it reads, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Right? He had compassion. And notice what he did next. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Not only that, notice what he did. Okay? On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them the, to the innkeeper, said, take care of him, whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. In other words, the good Samaritan, we know him as the good Samaritan, went out of his way, went the second mile, the third, the fourth, the fifth mile to help an individual, right? Usually we'll say, okay, all right, the EMT are here, the ambulance are here, goodbye, adios. No, he said, hey, I'm going to take care of you. Take care of you. Notice how far he went here. What's interesting, friends, is that we want to be in a church that is compassionate, a church that loves lost people. What we want to say here to, as a church, we need to leave the four walls of this church just like Jesus did, right? Jesus preached at the temple. He preached at the mountainside and the lakeside, but he was there out with the people. There are people who are realizing this is important. Because when Jesus said in verse 37 to the lawyer, which of these three do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? He said, he who showed mercy on him. Jesus said, go and do likewise. Ladies and gentlemen, the church cannot be comfortable inside the walls of this church while hell is breaking loose outside. This is not a real church if it does that. It keeps doing this. The church that should be the church that feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, the church that mentors children after school. By the way, a lot of teenage kids come home with no parents at home. Why? Because the parents are working, trying to make ends meet, trying to put food on the table. There's a lot of girls that get pregnant out of wedlock because there's nobody home. When teenage boys get involved with gangs, we're talking about violence, violence that we're seeing here in, in, in our nation. It's not just happening, it's because of what's being sown each day, each week. There's nobody there to guide them, nobody to show up, to go out of the way to show them how to live the Christ-like way. Well, what, as far as the parents' responsibility, what if the parents themselves are so crippled, they're in bondage, they're addicted to drugs, they're, they're in jail? Who is to go? We need to go. As the people of God, we need to go where they are. We need to go in the community. Imagine, my friends, creating a flyer that says something like this. Our church is offering to all families free marital counseling. Those who want to get married, engage in counter. A free wedding. Imagine free baby dedication. Free mowing lawn service. Somebody approached me several weeks ago, one of our members here, they said, Pastor, I want to, I want to offer free oil change to anyone here in the church. I said, praise the Lord, we'll work it out. Okay? Amen? And you imagine this, my friends, in... Every day, our community is suffering through slavery. One, third, one out of three girls and one out of five boys are being exploited sexually through human trafficking. The problem is, we are not doing anything for this community. 
And we need to stop that if we need to make a difference. We need less random acts if we need, and what we need is more intentionality. There's a, lot, there's a group of Adventist uh, people that went to a community. They tried to help uh, do some kind of a project to help the homeless. And one of the homeless persons says, you know what? He talked to one of my friend. He said, you know, we like what you're doing, but a lot of our people here don't trust you. I said, why is that? Because you, because you only come once a year. When you go home, you're happy that you did some good deed, but what about every day? We're hungry, we're hurting, we need help. And so what we need, my friends, is this. He says here, we need, we need to do a ministry of compassion to the people in our community on a regular basis. You know, it's good to be handing out water to the people randomly, but you know what? We need to be more focused. What if... What if you go to a park on the same time every Sabbath afternoon to the people playing out bas- playing basketball or soccer, and you could, you're there once a week, and they begin to ask, what is it? Why are you doing this? What is motivating you to give to show compassion to us? They may begin to ask, and you're able to develop relationships. Compassion is this. We do something good to people with no strings attached. Right? If nothing happens as a result of it, that's fine. We did the right thing. Right? We did what Jesus would have done. Eventually, we'll, when people will keep seeing this consistent, compassionate acts being shown, eventually it will drive some people to find out what's driving you to love me like that. What's the best definition of rev- relevance? Being there when you're needed. Being there when you need it. We want a church that people can say this is a church at the center of God's love, the center of the compassion of Jesus. A church is an agent and transformational agent for families and the community. And the church that freely gives out the way how to find salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen? Compassion 100 basically is this. We want 100 people showing acts of compassion. 100 projects in our community and neighborhood. 100 hours of service. Quarterly. Eventually becoming monthly. Eventually we want this to be weekly. We want you to have the opportunity. He said, Lord, we don't know the people who are living right here in their very neighborhood. Yeah, we do random things. I'm learning we can't do random things. We need to be consistent. That's why you're going to be given a piece of paper. It says adopt a street. Find a street. Doesn't, don't try to figure out which one is best. They're all close by anyway, all right? They're literally, literally quarter of a mile. But the main thing, find a street, put your name down. What we want you to do is this. We want you to, when church is over, if you're going home or after lunch, go to that street and pray for the people living there. Pray. That's all I want you to do first. Pray. Say, Lord, we don't know who the people are living here, but we want you to touch their hearts. We want you to prepare their hearts because we have not yet got to know them. Eventually, we're going to invite you to show ways of acts of compassion. Okay, acts of compassion. How to get to know them. We'll find out how, we'll try to find out their needs. So this is going to be important. Let me share with you the story that took place in 2013. My friend Jose Cortez basically shared this story uh, he was the youth director for the Atlantic Union when they did this through NY13, when this took place several years ago. They basically held what you call, there were many, there, the goal is basically throughout New York, greater New York, we're talking about going to hold evangelic series. Well, they had already a lot of pastors, so since he was the youth director, he said, you know what? Let me get, gather all the young people, all the youth, and do what we call acts of compassion. And so what they did was basically they, uh, uh, they had through every, every week, they would do acts of compassion, like mow people's lawn. They would rake people's yard. They would do some uh, help people, uh, whatever their needs were. Uh, they, uh, they ministered to the individuals. And then finally, they made it basically a full weekend from Friday, Saturday, and, and Sunday to make this a, a compassion weekend. You know, they were expecting at least maybe 100 people, but they had over 800 people show up to do this. 
Okay? And so, so what happened was so they, they, said, they finally came to the point where they said, let's do this compassion on a regular basis. And, and then when they did this final weekend, a compassion weekend they're going to have, this is where they're going to do all out on the full weekend itself. They're going to also have a march, a march for compassion against violence. And um, so they had, they were ha planning for a thousand people. Eight thousand people showed up. Some of them were liberals, some of them were traditional, the adventurers, the pathfinders, young adults, all sorts of ages. They all came to New York. And so they basically, here you see in Times Square, evidence from over 10 states came and helped out in this Compassion Weekend. Okay? And also, the, the, in Times Square, they had thousands of young Adventists singing songs. They sang about compassion through Jesus Christ. And uh, what's interesting was that uh, they, when they did the march in the afternoon, you could see a sea of white shirts, they said, basically. The, the police were saying, I thought you said you were going to have at least estimate of 2,000 people, but there's 8,000 here. And so on, the Manhattan, on Brooklyn Bridge, you saw basically thousands and thousands of Adventists. Basically, uh, they're promoting this compassion. Compassion. So compassion floods in New York City, that's what the sign said. And they had Pathfinders, the drum corps, leading out on that. And uh, Congresswoman uh, Yvette Clark praises the initiative against violence. Thousands of them met at the... the uh, Cadman Plaza Park on Saturday to promote compassion. And they dared to ask for a press conference. Well, you have to understand, this was a huge initiative by the North American Division. And the General Conference President hold an, held an evangelistic series for three weeks. For three weeks. I want you to know this. But no press came to, that, to his series. But when they asked... When the young people asked, we want the press conference, they were, they were going to be happy if only one TV station showed up. But 12 stations showed up and interviewed the young people. What's going on here? Why are you doing this? And, and so what's interesting, they interviewed them. They were broadcasted basically in all the networks there. During that time, they had Occupy Wall Street going on, which was a, basically a political uh, march. But this one, they're saying, is a compassion march. It's a moral march. It's an opportunity to show people that we are here to help people to show uh, the love of Jesus Christ. They were moved by the compassion of thousands of Adventist shoots. And, and it was interesting. They did so many kinds of acts of compassion that they thought they were not going to be able to touch New York City. But New York woke up and said, what is going on here? This is amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm asking you to think about this passage right here. In Christ's Object Lessons, it reads, The sanctification of the soul by the working of the Holy Spirit is the implanting of Christ's nature in humanity. What is it? Implanting, right? Gospel of religion is Christ in the life, a living, active principle. It is the grace of Christ revealed in character and wrought out in what? Good works. Now, Say, spell it out, Pastor. What does that mean? You don't do acts of kindness and compassionate acts in order for you to have Christ in you. Are you with me? It is because Christ is in you, right? He's been implanted the nature of Christ in you. That, therefore, that's why you do compassionate acts. Hello, amen? Amen. And so this is powerful. You see here what we're trying to say. People, we're praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is in you, then you move on and go forward and do something here for God's kingdom. Right? It continues. Love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. We can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. So I'm not here trying to tell you, go out and just do acts of kindness by itself. Because you know what? That's going to wear out. Eventually you're going to say, oh, I'm too busy. You're going to act like the Levites and the priest. You see people in need, but you're going to walk by them. 
what motivates people to show acts of compassion is because the Holy Spirit is moving in your life. The Holy Spirit has activated something in you, and when you see somebody hurting, you're there and you're moved by that. What is needed here is the love of Christ. What does it say? In the heart, when self is merged in Christ, love speaks forth. How? Spontaneously. I'm going to say amen for you, friends. Amen? Spontaneously. It's not choreographed. It's not everybody saying, do this. Spontaneously, you're going to do this. God's going to let you do, you do things through the Holy Spirit. And finally, she closes with this. Oops. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse of help and to help and bless others spring constantly from within. Notice the word constantly, right? Not once a year. When the sunshine of heaven fills the heart, it is revealed in the countenance. It is not possible for the heart in which Christ abides to be destitute of love. What does the word destitute mean? Lacking, low on, on that, right? If we love God, if the love of God, if we love God because he first loved us, we shall love all for whom Christ died. I said, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to close with this story that took place. His name, Desmond Doss. He joined the army in April 1, 1942. Three and a half years later, when he joined the army, he'll be standing in front of the White House lawn, reaching, being given the highest award for his bravery and courage under fire. There were, 16 mil, uh, six, there were millions of soldiers in uniform during World War II, and only 431 received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Among these was Desmond Doss. He was a conscientious objector. What does that mean? He doesn't want to bear arms. His only weapons were his Bible and faith in God. The scene basically is told in, 19, in May 5, 1945. There, the Japanese were fiercely defending Okinawa the only remaining bearer to the Allied invasion of their homeland is a place called Maeda Escarpment, an imposing rock face, basically 700 feet up. It's what they called Hacksaw Ridge. After the Allied forces secured the top of the cliff, all of a sudden the Japanese forces attacked. The officers ordered retreat. Everybody started to retreat. Out of 155 soldiers that went up there, Allied force that went up there, only 55 were able to climb down, back down on their own. The rest were shot down, wounded. And as they were, as they were uh, there, lying, dying on enemy soil, one lone soldier disobeyed orders, and he charged back among the firefight. With a constant prayer on his lips, he prayed the prayers to help those who were dying. With his iron determination and unflagging courage, he, resumed, he, he rescued at least 75 lives that day. When he was given that award, President Truman said, giving him the Medal of Honor, he said these words, I'd rather have this model medal than be the president. You really deserve this, he said. You really deserve this. What was interesting was, was you know, when Desmond Doss was given this award, and now there's a film being um, uh, going to be released in November by uh, blockbuster producer Mel Gibson. Uh, you know, when they were asked, by the way, it's the only film, they said basically it's a film that is showing a good portrayal of, of the Adventist church, of an Adventist in the movie. Now, one thing that they did say, though, is this, they asked this question. As they were making the movie, why did you, why did you show in your movie? Okay, Why did you show in the movie? Basically, they said this, that 
you are showing them pulling Desmond Doss pulling the soldiers from from the firefight and down and basically to rescue them. And you know what? Desmond Doss actually lifted lifted these wounded soldiers on his shoulder and brought them then we put them tied them up and brought them down the, the cliff. When he was being awarded, basically, they said he had rescued, the army said, reported, they rescued 100. Rest 100 soldiers. Desmond does, I couldn't have done that. I could not have done that, he said. He said, I think about 50. So they made a compromise. They said 75. 75. Now, one thing I'm sharing this is this. I mean, about this story is that Desmond Doss, when he was there, when he went to rescue the soldiers that were wounded, he prayed the prayer. He prayed the prayer that said like this, Lord, help me get one more. One more. Just one more. As he rescued one individual, put him on his back, he got two soldiers to safety. Then he prayed the prayer, Lord, just give me one more. One more. He came back to the firefight and he brought him back again. On the f- fourth, the fifth, the tenth, he kept praying, Lord, one more. Just give me one more. One more. He was willing to collapse, collapse of exhaustion or be killed by the, by the uh, enemy fire. But he continued praying that prayer, Lord, help me get one more. Just one more. Finally, Desmond Dawes, when he had rescued, quotes, the 75 soldiers, people were wondering, how did you do it? You know, in the movie, the producers were saying, the reason why we don't show him lifting up people in the shoulders is because nobody would believe us. No one would believe the movie. It's impossible that people would carry them on the shoulders. What I'm sharing here, my friends, it's something here that's beyond. When you are going in God's errands, in a mission of compassion, the Holy Spirit takes over you and gives you supernatural strength. This is not, this is not Desmond Doss killed in soldiers. He was almost court-martialed. He was almost discharged from the army. They, they ridiculed him. They made fun of him because he was Evans. When he would read the Bible, they'd throw their boots at him. They said, we don't want you in the battle. We want you to die in battle because you're no good to us. You don't carry a gun. Every day he would read his, his Bible, little pocket Bible. Every day he would pray, Lord, help me to make a difference. Help me to live for you. Ladies and gentlemen, we, that date, May 5, 1945, was a Saturday, was a Sabbath. Desmond Doss did the most compassionate thing. He could have sat down, well, this is my Sabbath. I'm going to sit down and rest and worship God. Hallelujah. And say, give me that old time religion. Right? Singing. But instead, he saw somebody hurting, and he went out there in in the midst of, of the firefight. There, he rescued the wounded, the hurting. He went out of his way. The question is, what would happen to them if I do not go there and help them? Question for you is, my friends, what would happen to you if you do not go out? Will you also pray the prayer, Lord, just give me one more, one more, one more that I can pray for, one more I can reach with the gospel, one more that I can show acts of kindness. Lord, give me one more. One more. One more. Are you willing to say to the Lord, Lord, use me? You know what? When people begin to implement this acts of compassion, it, be- it goes viral. It goes viral. Because you know what? People like this kind of stories. But you know what? I'm not into for the accolades of people. I'm here to give glory to God. Give honor to God. We're going to be handing out a piece of paper for you to fill out. I'm going to ask the ushers, ushers, to get go ahead and 
send those paper out. I want you to, to go ahead and there's going to be a, a dop of street and there's going to be pieces of paper here you're going to receive. Don't just throw them away. If you're not going to take them, my friends, then when you go, just put them aside. But don't throw them away. Because there are people here who are asking you to give an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. Well, Pastor, well, I don't really live here. You know, I, I just come drive by to church. But you know what? God needs you in, your, in his vineyard. I want you to, to, to take a moment, fill this out. Don't, don't, you don't have to study where all the streets are. Just point to one of the streets and just say, I'm going to take this one. And the prayer will be, Lord, help me to reach one person for Jesus Christ. Just one person for Jesus Christ, Lord. One more for Jesus Christ. What do you say? As you receive the piece of paper, I want you to, to um, fill that out. As music is being played, it gives you an opportunity to fill it out for a moment. It won't take long. It's not a long thing. Just put your name, pick a street. And if you receive the ministry uh, placement, then put down what you can, how you can get involved. But right now, just pick a street. Let's take this moment now to pray to the Lord. Let's take a moment. Stand with me now. Stand with me. Don't worry about the rest. You can do that afterwards. AV team, if you can get that music, this so sweet to trust in Jesus, flash on the screen, that would be great. So sweet. What's the number for that song? In Jesus, just to take him at his just to his promise and to know that saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I prove him or Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust in. Before we sing the second line, I want you to know this song is about trusting Jesus. When people are not in that relationship with Jesus, not trusting Him, that's when we pass by people who are hurting along the way. We rush by and not able to show acts of compassion because we say we need this time to take care of our, our work, to take care of our things at home, to take care of um, finances. I don't have time, Pastor. I don't have time. The song is about trusting Jesus. Are you willing to trust Him? Willing to trust Him with everything. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. It's going to take time when you reach out to people. It's going to take time. It's going to involve you. Instead of you just being able to go home, I'm inviting you this afternoon, stop by those streets and pray. Start praying for them. But you know what? If you don't go, who else would go? You will miss the greatest opportunity, miss the greatest blessing that God can use you to activate the Holy Spirit in your life to show love and kindness. Right now, it's going to be a simple one. It's being able just to pray for them. But next few weeks, we're going to...
going to be handing out an opportunity to find out their needs. Compassion 100 is just a simple slogan. It's not, I don't want, basically, what's important, what's in your heart. If Christ is not in your heart, let's get make sure Christ is in our heart first. Amen? Pray with me. Father in heaven, I come now to you, asking you, dear Father, to pour your spirit in a powerful way. Lord, we can come to church week after week after week. We can hear messages here. We can sing songs. But if we're not doing anything, Lord, to those who are hurting, to those who are brokenhearted, to those who are captive, you've, you, you've asked us to go and make disciples. So we're going there in the name of Christ, in the name of Jesus. So dear Father, I'm just asking you, I'm not asking people here to do it on their own strength. I'm asking you to fill everyone here with your spirit if they are willing to go for your kingdom. Dear Father, will you give us, Lord, at the initial of this, people will say, we need, we want to be part of this. Thank you, dear Father, for hearing my prayers as we close this service. In Jesus' precious, powerful name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen.